loud enough to overpower mute. Okay. Um, well, good morning, everybody. We're so glad that you're here this morning for um, our first last lecture of this semester. Uh, many of you have joined us many times. For anybody who's new, this, these last lectures are an opportunity for a faculty or staff member to share the wisdom they might want to share with the campus community if it were their last time speaking to us. It is not. Rosemary's got a lot to do. Um, but uh, the premise is what might they want to say if it were their last moment with us uh, working on campus. Well, we're so glad you're here. The air is cold and the forecast is worse, right? Um, so it's good to gather in the warmth of community story and wisdom. And I'm so pleased that we're here this morning with Dr. Rosemary Sands, who directs our, our study abroad. She came to St. Norbert in 1993 and has served this campus in many wonderful and significant ways in and out of the classroom. In my experience, I've seen that Rosemary is a woman of faith, hospitality, insight, humor, and great kindness. I also know that if you meet with her on a cold day, she can pull a killer shot of espresso, note to self. <laughs> uh, so I'm very excited and uh, pleased to have her start off this semester's series of last lectures, and I invite you to join me in welcoming Rosemary Sands. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out. I said to Julie, well, maybe nobody will show up. It's pretty cold out in a walk from the parking lot to your own bu building is hard enough. Um, I also said to Julie, what was I thinking when I agreed to this date? Study abroad deadline is on Monday. I'm running the office by myself instead of with a staff of three. Well, not by myself. I have fabulous team here. Yes, Hannah. Um, and Luke and Shelley. Uh, so we have the deadline next week. Um, two days ago, we were hosting a new exchange visitor from England. And later this week, we're doing interviews for the study abroad advisor position. So yeah, just another day in the life. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, those of you who know me um, know that I'm rarely, if ever, at a loss for words. Uh, my mom used to love to tell the story of when I started kindergarten. Um, I have a September birthday. So the first day of school, I was still four. Uh, so there I was at St. Paul's Catholic grade school in Wellesley, Massachusetts, and uh, my mother left me off for first day of school. And after a few days, uh, Sister Ann Mercedes, that was really her name, she looked like she was about 80 then, and I heard a few years ago that she's still alive. She must have maybe been, I don't know, 15 or 20. Anyway, she got a hold of my mom, and she said, Mrs. Sands, I think you need to rethink this and have Rosemary sit out for the year. She's really timid, so shy. And she hasn't yet said a word. And my mom, without missing a beat, said, are we talking about the same Rosemary? <laughs> because at home, I was not silent at all. In fact, um, I shared a uh, bedroom with my um, two sisters. Here we are. Uh, <laughs> growing up. So the three of us, Marie is five years older than I am, and Sheila is two years older than I am, and me. Um, we shared a bedroom. And oftentimes, they'd ask me to tell stories at bedtime. Was it because I was such a great storyteller? I don't think so. It was because I would drone on and on and on and bore them to sleep. Um, anyway, so there we are. I'm the one with the mouth open. Surprise. <laughs> Marie, the oldest, is looking demure and responsible. And Sheila, you can't really see it. The quality of the picture isn't so great. But she's wearing blue pop beads. This was long before she became a VP for Banana Republic. But anyway, <laughs> she was showing her fashion sense back then. It was about 1957 or 58, I think. I don't know. Um, but going back to being truly at a loss for words, uh, when I saw the message from Julie with the subject line, an invitation to consider, sorry for giving this away. You're going to have to think of a different subject line. <laughs> Your future victims will be on to it. I was pretty sure what that invitation might be. So like any sensible person, I didn't open it. And every time I looked at my screen, which is like 99% of my day, there was that unread message mocking me, taunting me, daring me to open it. So I finally did. And like any sensible person, I saved it as unread. <laughs> How many of you do that? Do you open a message, you're like, I don't want to deal with this right now, save it as unread, and you know, maybe it'll go away. Well, the message didn't go away, and I finally did get back to Julie. I think it was just the next day. In my mind, I was thinking it was like a week later, but I looked up my emails and... There it was, and I said that 
although I was honored to have been invited, I, I needed to discern a bit because after all, truth, truthfully and seriously, what could I possibly have to say that would be worthy of a last lecture? We, those of us who have been coming to these uh, for the past two and a half years now, right, since the fall of 2011, have uh, been uh, lucky enough to hear words of wisdom, great depth, and, um, and, and wonderful, wonderful messages. The entire series was kicked off by my dear colleague, Sarah Griffith, who uh, pretty much set the bar way too high for me. But here I am, and I'm gonna give it my best shot today. Um, as I ruminated over what I might say, I kept going back to lessons learned as a child that have served me well throughout the years. I thought of sayings that have become part of the fabric of my life, handed down from generation to generation, from my grandparents to my parents, to me and my siblings, and on to our children. And that made me think of how the first family saying I'm going to talk about today dovetails really nicely with our theme for the year, love one another. The motto of our founder, uh, Abbot Bernard Penning. I was fortunate enough to be born into a very close and loving family. I was the fourth of five kids, the third girl. Uh, 10 years between the oldest boy and the youngest boy. So there's Gregory Marie with the ringlets. Mom did that every morning. How could she do that? Um, <laughs> Sheila's missing her teeth and me and then Christopher. Uh, yikes, stripes. Good thing this wasn't in color, huh? I don't think they had color film back then, but uh, maybe they did. Anyway, there's my family. So I was born into this loving family. And <clears throat> to this day, I talk to one of my siblings or text with them Maybe not every day, but pretty much every other day, there is a lot going on with my siblings. And we're spread out. Massachusetts, California, Wisconsin, but they still are my best friends, and I cherish them. I know that not everyone is as fortunate as I was to have been born into a close and loving family, so I would encourage all of us to think about the definition of family in a more encompassing way. Uh, family is how you define it. It can be comprised of those who mean the most to you, those, are who, those who are your touchstone, those who have your back. If you were not born into a close-knit family, create your own family from kind and loving friends, from colleagues, from coworkers who truly care about you, from those who you nurture and those who nurture you. My dad, Charlie Sands, who died 19 years ago this past Monday, he was the first loss I had in my life. I was really, really lucky. I was 40 when he died, and I had not experienced any loss before then. Uh, so yes, you can do the math, I'm 59. Uh, <laughs> he was a very typical 1950s, 1960s era dad. He worked really hard to provide for his family. Um, oh yeah, back to that family. That's the, the photo from my first birthday, and we're still rocking the mismatched patterns, I don't know what's going on. I think actually Sheila and Maria are wearing aprons. I think they help mom decorate the cake because Sheila has frosting all over her cake, uh, all over her face. Uh, anyway, so that is the family. Mom, she wasn't too much of a fan of confrontation or squabbling of any kind, and she was the one who spent the majority of the time with us. Dad was busy working. So anytime we'd start bickering or squabbling or fighting, she would quote her mother and she'd say, fight ye devils, fight, I hate peace. Soon to be followed by, the whole world is out there waiting to fight with you. Don't fight with your brothers and sisters. Don't fight with your brothers and sisters. And I'm thinking that her words weren't working so well in this photo based on our facial expression. <laughs> <laughs> this was taken after a long car trip through upstate New York in pre-minivan days, we didn't even have a station wagon. How all seven of us crammed into Dad's sedan is beyond me. But anyway, that was it. We don't look very happy. But notice my skirt. It says, te amo. A harbinger of things to come with my love of all things Spanish later in life. Little did I know. Um, my grandmother, just like my mother, spent long hours raising her five children. My mom was from a family of five. I'm from a family of five. She also seems to have shared that low threshold for rambunctious behavior, at least according to what my mom said. My grandfather died when my mother, the youngest of five, was only two years old. So this was taken probably right after my grandfather died, I'm thinking. So there they are, my grandmother, Mary Bridget, uh, my uncle, John, 
Francis, Timothy, Aunt Mary, and then my mom, the baby. Good Irish names. Uh, my grandmother instilled in her children the importance of keeping the peace with each other, of watching out for each other, of taking care of each other. She was a poor Irish immigrant who took in laundry to support the family after my grandfather died. She expected each child, as soon as he or she was able, to get a job so as to contribute to the family. One by one, they took turns helping each other get through school, get through life. The oldest became a lawyer, the next one a doctor. My aunt was the speech specialist for the Hartford, Connecticut School District. And throughout their lives, they modeled for us what it meant to not fight with your brothers and sisters, how to take care of each other, how to watch out for each other, how to place each other's needs before their own, and how to love each other. And again, I quote Abbott Penning, let us love one another. My mother and my grandmother would have really liked that. My mom and her siblings are all deceased now, but until the very end, they kept in frequent touch with each other. Um, I remember back in the day before cell phones and, and when long distance calls actually cost money. Uh, mom and Aunt Mary would take turns calling each other on Sunday night, because Sunday night you could get this package and you know, I don't know, $5 a month for unlimited calling on Sunday night. And they would keep track of whose turn it was. Well, it's her nickel, it's my nickel. But they, they talked to each other every single week, even though Aunt Mary was still in Connecticut and we had since moved to Wisconsin. Um, they learned from their mother, not just mom and Aunt Mary, but all of the siblings, how to cherish each other despite temporary disagreements, misunderstandings, or arguments, and how to keep the peace. I can't help but think of St. Norbert, who was known as the peacemaker as one who was able to forge peace treaties between warring factions wherever he went. What small part can each of us play in making peace? My mother's admonishment, the whole world is out there waiting to fight with you, don't fight with your brothers and sisters, doesn't mean that you can't or shouldn't hold your own. It doesn't mean that you always have to give in to the other's wishes, but it does mean that you need to listen and try to find a compromise. And even if one is not to be found, it means don't make enemies. How can we be peacemakers in our daily lives, at home, in the classroom, in the residence halls, in the workplace? How can we help to build bridges rather than erect barriers? There's Dad, looking like the consummate 1950s businessman. He actually started out after the war, he was in the Navy, and after the war he and my mom got married, he and my mom got married, and he became the public relations director for the Boston Braves. Boston, not Milwaukee Braves, not Atlanta Braves, Boston Braves. And when they moved to Milwaukee, he said, no, I'm not moving my family to Milwaukee. <laughs> 18 years later when he was working for Schlitz, they transferred him to Wisconsin. He's like, I give up, God wants us in Wisconsin, we're here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Dad was quite the talker too, so I didn't just inherit this from one side of the family, it was both sides. Um, he always said the same thing when he was saying goodbye to people, anyone, whether he, they were strangers or friends, or he would always say, keep the faith. This is the second saying I'm going to talk about today. This saying has stayed with me throughout the years. Was dad quoting Paul? I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Did he literally mean keep the faith, the Catholic faith, or faith in God? I don't know. Did he mean have faith in yourself? Maybe the saying took on a new meaning to whomever he said it. Just as I'm cognizant that not everyone was born into a kind and loving family and that we have to have different definitions of family, I also realize that not everyone's definition of faith is the same. Whether it means different types of religious faith, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, whatever it might be, or faith in some higher power, or faith in oneself, or faith in others, we can all aspire to having faith in something, to keeping the faith. There we are again. That's the shot from your birthday photo, of course. Birthdays. I think we had just moved to Milwaukee. Clinched fists. I really don't like it here at all. Um, <laughs> Mom and dad on Cape Cod, they, long after we moved to Wisconsin, they kept going back to rent a cottage on the Cape every summer, and that was their favorite place to be. And we still, I don't, since I spent so many summers at Middlebury, I would try to get to the Cape after Middlebury. Uh, I wasn't always successful, but this summer I think I'm going back again because my sister still runs a cottage there. My brother's kids are there. Uh, so it's really, it means a lot to our family. 
Um, Dad was a very faith-filled person, as was my mom. They passed that faith on to us, which for me was the greatest gift they could have given me. I'm very private about my faith. I don't talk about it very often. Um, I usually don't go around talking about it at all. But today, I want to talk about how my faith has sustained me, has nourished me, and has helped me get through dark days and long nights without answers. It's a constant in my life whether I'm celebrating or suffering or just getting through another day at work, just because I have faith doesn't mean I have blind faith that everything, everything's going to turn out okay. Absolutely not. Any of you who have suffered the loss of a loved one or the loss of a relationship, have had a serious illness or know someone with a serious illness or just have had disappointments and setbacks, everybody knows that it doesn't always turn out okay. Remember my brother, Greg? There you are. He was diagnosed with kidney failure right after my mom died in October of 2000. Um, here we are in Cape Cod in 2001. He was our Cape Cod again. And I always said, you know, everybody's going to think we lived in really ramshackle houses because we always have photos in these rental cottages that were decorated like not very well. Anyway, um, <laughs> Greg was already pretty sick in this picture. Um, I can tell those of you who wouldn't have seen him normally, he was a much bigger guy. Uh, I had just undergone testing and was found to be nearly a perfect match for a kidney transplant. We attempted the transplant three times between December of 2001 and January of 2003. The first two were called off the day before surgery due to Greg's failing health, including at one point a subdural hematoma, a craniotomy, being in a coma for three weeks, but the third time was a charm, was a charm, and, and the transplant, which took place in January of 2003, was a success. However, 18 months later, he was diagnosed with cancer, and he died in 2006, leaving behind three children, the oldest of whom was five days shy of her graduation from Boston College. Greg never gave up the faith, and I don't mean that he thought he was going to get better. He had faith that we, his siblings, and his children would make it through the darkness and the sorrow. <clears throat> he always had a kind word for friends and strangers alike, a joke to tell, and he never dwelt on the less than great hand he had been dealt in life. He was one of the kindest people I've ever known. Did everything turn out okay? Absolutely not. Did we make it through? Absolutely. And that is what keeping the faith means to me. My faith is my sustenance and it keeps me balanced when not everything is going right. It is having faith that I will find what it takes to make it through, no matter the outcome. It is a great source of consolation for me, and as I mentioned earlier, the gift I cherish most from my parents. My mother used to say that my grandmother's take on this, on having the faith she would find whatever it took to make it through, is that she would always pray that God would fit her back to the burden. She did not ask for an easier life, she asked for strength and the faith to be able to withstand whatever came her way. And so I leave you today with my words to live by. Don't fight with your brothers and sisters. Keep the faith. And of course, Abbott Penning's motto, love one another. Make friends, not enemies, and always have faith in something. In God, in life, in your friends, in yourself, that you will make it through life's challenges, both big and small. Two more slides before I end. I've been so busy showing photos of my family, I would be remiss if I didn't show you photos of my son. Which one do you think is the computer programmer and which one is the artist? <laughs> they are as different as night and day. Nick is the older one, the computer programmer, and Nate is my younger one. He works for Patagonia in their video department, but he's like this outdoor guy and he does photography and video and drawing and sketching, and he's just amazingly creative in that regard, and Nick's got the whole computer uh, programming thing down. Um, they are as different as night and day, but they've always been there for each other because they grew up hearing me say, spicy dibble spite, I hate peace. Uh, I quoted it to them on more than one occasion when they were growing up. Thank you for taking the time to come and listen today. Thank you for braving the cold, and thank you, Julie, for the invitation to consider.